Hello everyone, today is January 2nd. First of all, Happy New Year. And hopefully 2023 will not only be profitable, but uh, whatever you wish it will be. Okay, uh, but we're here uh, today uh, to start the Wake of Trading Course Part 1. Um, so uh, there are two groups uh, of people that we have uh, in this session, and that is the students that already signed up and uh, our guests. Uh, so welcome. And I'm going to walk you through some of the things that are going to be covered in this course, um, some of the things that uh, we're going to cover in other courses. And more importantly, we're going to start on the material today. Uh, this is the first class of the Wake of Trading course. So we're going to start working right away. As usual, everything that we discuss uh, during these sessions is for educational purposes only. Please stop your recording and read the, the disclaimer in full. Uh, here is our schedule. Uh, so we're here, January 2nd, 15 sessions. All of the sessions are going to uh, start live at 3 p.m. each Monday uh, Pacific time. Uh, so uh, please make sure that this is on your calendar recurring for the next uh, 14 sessions. And uh, if you cannot attend, and this is a very common question, uh, what if I cannot attend live because I live somewhere in Asia or Middle East or maybe in Europe? Uh, yeah, no problem, guys. You could uh, watch the recording at your convenience, uh, literally the same or day when it's uploaded. Uh, usually this happens, you know, about two and a half, three hours afterwards. We need to encode the video, we need to upload it, we need uh, to put the watermark on the video and so on and so forth. So it's kind of like a long process. Uh, but then once it's all done, in about three hours, you will have the access to this. For those of you who are students already in this class, so you will become a student in this class, you will have the access or you do have the access to the student profile page where we are going to upload the video, upload the slides from this session, and also upload the slides for your homework. So this is where you're going to go uh, to uh, download uh, the file with the homework, and then you're going to start working on that. All right, well, uh, as long as we're talking about the homework, uh, let's quickly talk about this. Uh, and I will repeat this in the next session, but what's really, really important to me is that you send me only one file per homework. Uh, if you're going to send me, let's say, five to ten files with each chart, and your homework mostly is going to be uh, chart reading. I'm going to give you the chart, or charts, rather, and then you would have to apply the knowledge um, that we've, we've learned uh, during the class. And I would like you to send it in the specific formats uh, of the file, uh, PowerPoint, PDF, or... Uh, Word doc. I also would like you to name the file correctly. You are in the WTC1 class, let's say homework number one, and then you know for your first name and uh, the first letter of your last name. And all of the homeworks, or if you have any questions, uh, should be sent to Wyckoff Associates at gmail.com. I will be uh, going through all of the homeworks uh, in preparation for the next session. And then if you have any administrative questions for Nancy, then you could always uh, send us an email or send Nancy an email to Associates at gmail.com. For those of you who are thinking uh, that you're going to sign up for this course, uh, so it's 15 sessions, uh, consider the payment plan. Uh, uh, this is probably an easier option. Uh, and for those of you who already WTC one alumni, then your rate is 700. Okay, with that, let's uh, quickly talk about the curriculum and what is it exactly that we're going to cover in this course. So the first five, six sessions uh, are going to be devoted to the market structural analysis. And they're in there, the most important things um, that we're going to go through at the basic of how the structure unfolds uh, from let's say one price structural environment let's say of a trend going through the changes of behavior changes of character and then going into the consolidation where we are 
uh, observing specific YCAF events and YCAF phases for timing. Uh, this is going to be the basics uh, of the YCAF price structural analysis. But as always, I will be giving you not just the basics. I'm going to give you kind of like a logical chain uh, of thought uh, going from just the basics on the price structural analysis to the intermediate and more advanced concepts. And sometimes I would give it, give those to you almost as an assignment, and sometimes I will give it to you as kind of like a preview of what might come in WTC uh, part two. Then from uh, session six to about 11, we're gonna talk about volume and price analysis. This is a very popular uh, segment of the course with students because we go through not only through the theoretical material but we actually do a group exercise where I'm going to put the chart in front of the class and we're going to discuss what is it that we see on the chart how do we analyze it how do we make observations how do we make deductions and then what comes out of our analysis and that also will be a part of your homework for those five six sessions and in there, we'll be mostly talking about effort versus result. We'll talk about the bar by bar or VSA analysis. We'll talk about swing by swing analysis uh, and some other um, volume related case studies like volume, volume patterns in, uh, during the wake of, uh, wake of phases and how could we use the uh, um, analogs uh, for comparative uh, purposes. Then, uh, a short segment on the relative and comparative analysis, uh, only because majority of you are familiar uh, with those concepts. I'm going to just give you my take on that. And we're definitely going to start, as usual, with basics. So all of our education, uh, or at least you know the first major uh, courses, are devoted to the uh, building a very solid foundation in understanding of how the markets work and more importantly, how is it that we could see those concepts on the chart? How can we analyze the market through the chart reading? Uh, and here under the relative and comparative analysis, we'll talk about filtering and scanning. I'll show you my routine, the top-down approach um, and a number of other filtering techniques that I use. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, sweet spots of the outperformance and we'll, again, as I said, I'm just going to cover uh, the relative and comparative analysis uh, concepts. Then session number 14, trade management. This is where we're going to talk about the points of entry, points of exit, stop loss, uh, placement, movement, and uh, exiting uh, of the position. And then session number 15, as usual, is going to be all devoted to your questions. Uh, so this is uh, dependent on how quickly we are moving through the course. Uh, so sometimes, you know, I address some of the questions uh, during the first 14 sessions, and then sometimes I stop because we need to speed up the material, uh, and then we address everything during session number 15. We'll have to see. So that's the curriculum for us. Uh, looking ahead for this uh, semester. Then for those of you who are uh, familiar with WTC1 and you already taken, uh, and I just want to make sure that, you know, uh, those who already signed up or are you going to sign up for part one, you know what's coming next, part two. So part two is all about execution uh, and it's all, what, and we call this uh, course the practicum. This, is, this means that we're going to practice a lot. We're going to apply the knowledge uh, through the drills and exercises. Uh, we're going to concentrate a lot on the bias and timing. And specifically here, we're going to be uh, thinking a lot about the bias games that we publish each week. Uh, I'll talk about the bias game later on during the session. But the bias game is going to be based on a number of uh, types of analysis that we've invented for uh, the bias analysis. So I'm just going to call this sequential bias analysis. Uh, we have two types of those. And then flashcard analysis. And also the quantitative analysis. So 
without going into the depths of what this is, I'm just going to say that um, there was a requirement by our students, almost a request about you know five years ago or so, to identify st steps, the sequential steps, as we analyze the bias of the trading range. And I hope, hopefully, I'm intriguing somebody who has not heard uh, this type of terminologies. Uh, like, you know, the bias analysis or the sequential bias analysis or quantifiable bias analysis. And you guys are intrigued. Um, so with that, just going to leave it at that. I'm just going to say that in order for you to come to this level, you really have to go through this course, WTC 1 Part 1. Why? Because I'm teaching you how to observe correctly and how to analyze correctly, um, you know, the information of the chart because you would be surprised how many people actually may um, under-observe or observe something very subjectively, and therefore the wrongful data goes into your analysis and then the deductions are not made correctly, uh, are not done correctly. So um, for that, we need to start with part one and then uh, switch to part two. Also, we'll talk a lot about different you know, scenarios building, uh, trade management, uh, less so to the risk management, but it's going to be some part of it. Uh, how do we go through the selection? And then in the uh, practical uh, portion of the course, um, we're going to talk about uh, phase behaviors, volume signatures, trend analysis as well, optimization with the of YCF analysis with the uh, modern TA tools. We're going to do some coding in PineScript, and the, that coding is going to be associated with our, um, and this is a proprietary information uh, that I give my students, significant bar analysis, which could be a part of the VSA for you to understand, and also swing analysis. Uh, we also will be conducting, uh, as a part of the homework, and bias games uh, will be a part of your homework for those of you who are going to be practicum students. We're also going to uh, have the anatomy of the trade uh, exercise as the homework. Uh, so this is the exercise where you identify your mistakes in trading. And again, I do not want to go too much into this. For those of you who are interested in this particular course, tomorrow we have also the open door session, as always, Tuesday, January 3rd at 3 p.m. Pacific. So go to our website uh, and register. It's completely free. All right, today, uh, what are we going to do? Let's go through our um, curriculum for today. Uh, so we just went through the introduction. We'll talk about the homework, which is going to be Jim's Forte's Anatomy of the Trading Range. And for those of you even who are a guest today and you guys just want to like, you know, see what the class is about, but you're not going to register, I would really highly recommend going to our website and finding this uh, article, um, which is in PDF, uh, completely free. Uh, Jim Forte uh, was um, a, a friend, a student, a, a peer student of mine at Golden Gate University back in the 90s, uh, and he wrote this wonderful art article which is called Anatomy of a Trading Range for the uh, Market Technician Association at that time. Uh, I would say that uh, I consider this article is the best article written uh, ever not even by Hank, not even by Wyckoff himself or anyone else on price structural analysis. So that's kind of like a very high compliment for me. Then we're going to go through the market update. Uh, then we will switch to who Richard Wyckoff was, uh, the heuristic of the composite operator that we use in Wyckoff methodology. Then we'll talk about the price cycle model, which is the uh, foundation uh, of how we view accumulation, distribution, and the trends in between them. And together with that, we'll talk about the behavioral market analysis. I'll, I'll speak uh, to what the behavioral market analysis is and how do we interpret 
the and how do we see on the chart the presence of the strong hands against the weak hands institutional investors versus retail investors who are the market participants and what uh, are their traits uh, and characteristics and all of that will be through the case study of Apple and then in session number two next Monday we'll start talking details we'll talk about the change of character starting with the change of behavior then we'll talk about accumulation distribution reaccumulation uh, redistribution that will be spread out uh, throughout a couple of sessions uh, we can't cover everything right away um, and then we're gonna have our first non-reading homework uh, meaning that I'm gonna give you some charts and you will have to uh, label them and send those to me and then uh, a week after uh, during this session we will be reviewing your homeworks uh, question is being asked is this session recorded yes this session is being recorded and it will be posted on our like of trading method youtube channel tonight uh, again maybe within two to three hours you could find it there uh, so yes please uh, please use it all right Okay, so here is your homework. So for next week, the only thing that I would like you to do is, well, first of all, to make sure that you have the access uh, to your student profile, right? So student profile. By the way, under the student profile, I want you to see that we have the exam for you, for those of you who signed up. This is the, uh, probably a basic uh, exam um, assessing for you and for me, you want a current knowledge of like of methodology. And uh, it's not necessarily being graded. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, created to put any pressure on you, but it's kind of a reference point for us at the beginning of the course and then into the end of the course as to how you have progressed throughout the semester. So please make sure for those of you who already signed up or who's gonna sign up right now, uh, please make sure that you go through the exam. Also, we have a questionnaire that you should have received as well. So, and I would like to uh, for you to fill this out as well. Uh, this gives me an opportunity to know you personally, not just the group, not just the class, but you personally, and usually the questions there are, you know, what do you trade? How did you come about, you know, like of methodology and so on and so forth. And then the second uh, homework is gonna be, which is a mandatory assignment, is just to read Jim Forte's Anatomy of the Trade article. So again, uh, we will be uploading it for uh, signed up students uh, to your student profile under the course pages. And then for those of you who are just visitors, uh, you know, go to our website under the free materials, under the resources, you can find this article. All right, let's do the market update. Okay, and this is going to be a very, very common routine for us. Uh, each week, I'm going to go through the markets. Why do I do this? Well, because we want to apply and to show the application of our uh, like of training to you guys. And with that, let me ask you a question. So get ready to write the answers here. Okay. Uh, our first question is, what is the current trend? And please write it down in the question box. Okay, downtrend, trading range, downtrend. Okay, downtrend. Okay, majority of you are saying downtrend. Okay, I see that Jeff put the correct word in here, long term, it's a downtrend, okay. I see Tony is doing the same, a long term up, intermediate down. Okay, Peter is asking, what's the time frame? I think this is the most important question. What is the time frame? When anyone asks you, what is the trend, or you're referring to something like, oh, this is a trend, then 
you really have to define the time frame. So let's say like a long term, uh, let's say since the 2009 low, how would you characterize the uh, trend since the 2009 low, which is the secular low? Correct, all of you are saying it's an uptrend. An uptrend would be defined by simplistic higher highs, higher lows. You could also use other many, many indicators, um, like you could use the 100 million average. Uh, Hank used that for the definition of the primary trend, and that's what we're doing here. Okay, intermediate trend. And I would say that intermediate to me would be uh, two trends here. The first one that started on January 5th, which is to the downside, we're still having lower highs and lower lows so far, right? So here we kind of um, have not concluded this move, so we're still waiting to see what's going to happen here. Uh, if we're going to go up from here, then this will become the first higher low, so this is still under the question. Uh, and then the second trend, I would say, since this stop in action right here, this looks very climactic. Uh, the volume signature has increased locally uh, somewhat significantly in that after the possible attempt to stop right here. Uh, and then after that, we had an uh, automatic rally and a couple of secondary tests uh, for a possible phase A. Okay, so I'm just giving you Y of labeling right there. So since the selling climax, what kind of intermediate trend are we in here, guys? What do you see? Correct, a trading range. Yeah, we're going up and down, up and down. If we would be looking at this axis line right here, then we're seeing how the price deviates around this line right here yeah consolidation trading range sideways all of those are correct answers okay and then short term trend what is the short term trend currently and the short term trend would be a last swing what is the last swing i will teach you the technique of how to define that and you could find many, many ways of how to define the current swing, um, a zigzag option uh, and then, or the indicator is just the best for that. Um, I'm gonna do this based on the significant bar analysis. So we're seeing how after the attempt to up thrust, and we'll talk about this in a second, uh, we have the reversal day that switches the bias from the, um, upswing to the downswing and then we still have not overcome uh you know this area right here which would be uh if the price would commit above that with the close above that resistance line or the axis line this would be an upswing so currently we're still in the downswing and here it is so we are most definitely still in the downtrending environment, in the trading range environment, but the major secular trend is still up. And now that we know all of that, now we could go into some other parts of the analysis. Let's look at this trading range now. And as I said, you know, this dotted red line it's one of the most important uh, lines that we have here. Look at how many times we either stopped, uh, broke through, tried to go through, went through, tested it, tested it again, went through this again, tested it again, went through, test, 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 went through. Quite a lot of touches, right? Uh, attempts to go through tests, uh, breakthroughs, breakdowns, breakouts uh, around this axis line. So this is an extremely important line. And I just want to right away note, uh, uh, notice that we are actually currently residing under it. So as I just said, anything to the upside 
will be considered not just the uh, swing reversal, but also on the price structural level, this would be a really great sign for us that the price uh, reacted and then rebounded. But so far, we are under this line. And our first assumption is that, well, we are going to continue until the reversal. Uh, so one other thing for us to consider here is obviously the area of where we're stopping currently, right, with this reaction. The most important bar on the chart right now for us is going to be this bar right here. This was the CPI bar um, that um, showed a lot of buying behind it. Not just buying, but the ability of the price to actually uh, move easily to the upside. We definitely would prefer a little bit more extension here above the access line, but look at the subsequent test. Uh, it's quite favorable. There is not enough selling to push the price back below the access line. So this is a very, very important bar. So we want to identify the area of this bar, and we're going to say that anything uh, above this bar or within this bar uh, still should be considered as bullish until we actually violate the low of this bar. Why the low? Well, because this is where the buying has started by institutions. This is where they started buying and they are pushing the price up. So our assumption is the price comes back here, there will be some institutional buying again. And we're seeing that, let's say, in this price uh, volume signature, in this price volume signature, um, where we're seeing some hidden buying right here. But would this hidden buying be able to push the price up? Uh, that yet uh, uh, remains to be seen. Um, I also want to mention another very important bar on this chart, um, prior to the one that, you know, a bar that I've identified. This bar right here. Uh, this is also a CPI bar. So we kind of have uh, same catalyst, but different reaction um, to the news. Uh, after this spring event, which is basically a short-term commitment below the support, uh, we're seeing test, test, higher test. And now we are thinking, are we testing this big bar? And so far, we are holding Again, if we uh, were to look at the more short-term picture right here, we would be thinking that our bias is still to the downside here. Please don't forget that. Uh, why? Well, because look how a change of behavior has taken place relative to all of the previous reactions in the last move up. Right? We're looking at all of these reactions. The short-term uptrend channel also has been broken and has been broken correctly on the change of behavior bar, where we see the increase of the supply coming in and we're seeing that the price breaks that channel and commits below. And not only that, this bar was so important because it started to commit below the access line that I keep referring to. So short-term, still to the downside, we're looking at this area right here, and we could make an argument for both, right? For potentially going up and potentially going down. Now, what is my preference? First, you always go with the current trend. That's your first scenario. And because the current trend is to the downside, let's kind of like consider this. What would be a pot potential scenario of the continuation here? Oh, just commitment below this area right here. So this is a local support of the current trading range, and this is the support of that big CPI bar that I've talked about. So if we're uh, gradually committing to the downside, uh, it's going to be extremely hard uh, to not retest the area of support, which is defined previously by two events, by the first stop in action, sell and climax, and then by also the spring area. If we're going to break this local support, most likely we will retest this area right here. And we probably will come back 
to our 2008 analog, which is working still really well, uh, even at this point of time. And that would be suggestive of the continuation to the downside. I could definitely see how in 2023, we might have that continuation. We might go into the uh, full-blown recession. I do not expect that the US market uh, in particular uh, will go through a very deep recession. I think it might be very short recession and comparatively probably could be uh, way better uh, the, how the market actually reacts uh, to this recession in the US than in other parts of the world. Uh, we see this from the charts. We see that U.S. outperforms quite a few markets. Uh, so I probably would not expect a very deep and uh, long uh, duration recession. Uh, so if we are going into the recession, I'd be expecting that we probably be looking at uh, last quarter of 2023 to find some kind of you know more meaningful bottom uh, could come earlier. Uh, we've had, for instance, you know if we would analog it to the last year, our first leg down was in January into February lows as well. This also could happen uh, this way. Um, so we'd be looking at those both uh, time periods, uh, first quarter and the last quarter. Uh, but you know we'll have to see what ha what's going to happen immediately, almost like the first week of January. All right. So what else uh, is of interest to us here? Uh, let's talk about the bullish scenario. Are there any signs of bullishness that we're seeing? Well, there are plenty, and we've seen the, the a lot of bullishness in the rotational models. Uh, we're starting uh, from May, starting from June. Uh, we started seeing institutions actually buying the downtrends, especially you could see those in technology. You've, we've seen a lot of rotation into energy, right? Kind of like a supporting theme uh, right there since uh, May uh, of institutional buying in energy. Uh, we've seen a lot of buying in healthcare, uh, but uh, they did start buying some of the technology stocks and that started to stop their downtrends and as they continued uh, to be buyers uh, throughout summer and into fall then we started seeing how the trading ranges started to form it's a very interesting way of how and why the trading ranges are forming um, usually when we go into the consolidations you have to think that the opposing force to the current trend, which in this case, the downtrend, is emerging. And that's what stops the price from going further down. That's what produces better rallies in the trading range. Uh, that's what produces, let's say, sprint situations like this, and then any type of testing action. And we've seen all of those elements in this trading range. Now, the trading ranges could be uh, just a pause in the continuation of the trend. And that's the biggest question for us. Is this a redistribution or is this a new accumulation? And I would say again, it's the ability to produce a different type of behavior. So what do we mean by that? We mean that we need to see something different than this rally and then this reaction this rally and then this reaction this rally and then this reaction what would that difference be it's the ability and capacity of the price to overcome the uh, trending environment to break it so to say to to show a ch different behavior and that's why we're calling this a change of behavior so let's let's just kind of speculate here what if we start committing to the upside right here and instead of going all the way down we actually start to go up and not just touch the down sloping resistance but we'll do something different instead we will start committing above that line above that downtrending resistance would that look different it would 
for the first time. So then if this is gonna become a change of behavior, then the only thing that is required by us, uh, by Coffins, is to have some kind of test. Could we produce some kind of test and then continuation to that? Then we could most definitely say that this type of the conditions would become more bullish for us. And again, you know, oh, one of the things uh, that we do with students is we practice what we call a tactical scenario building. It, because we understand how the price structure in the trading range should unfold, then we could create different type of scenarios. We could create a bullish scenario or multiple bullish scenarios. We could create a um, bear scenario and usually the priority is being given to the current trend, right? So we start with usually the downtrend in scenarios uh, in the current environment, and then we go to bullish. Um, so for those of you who are looking for the change in the marketplace in 2023, uh, look for the change of behavior. Look for something that is different. And obviously, the more you practice with us, the more you will see something you know, almost immediately different. Like, for instance, look at how in these two cases, we're seeing a touch of the uh, resistance and then almost immediate move back uh, with some kind of test that comes later on, right? So very similar look in both cases. Now here, we're seeing something different. Uh, we're seeing a touch move back and then we had an upthrust uh, where that on the intraday level or uh, time frame overcame this downslope in resistance and actually almost touched the horizontal resistance uh, from the end of May. This in itself already showing some difference and we might be thinking that well um, with the price structural analysis, could we anticipate that maybe there's, there is some kind of additional push to some level of the support, maybe this level right here, maybe to the level of selling climax, and then some kind of recovery from here. Would If this is the case, could we uh, identify accumulation this way? Yes, we can. and usually that would characteristically uh, be visible on the last push to the downside, that's number one, and also on the local change of behavior plus test. And if we need, we would wait for the confirmation, which is basically the confirmation of the local breakout. That's another possibility for you that I'm giving you in this class, uh, for some kind of bullish type of resolution of this trend. Again, everything else, if the bullish scenarios do not materialize, then most definitely we're just following the path of the current downtrend. And specifically, I would refer you again to the 2008 analog. Uh, I would study this a lot, uh, if you are not familiar with that, and compare it to the current uh, price structure. Okay, let's go to some other charts. Let's look and uh, quickly talk about, let's say, NASDAQ. NASDAQ is most definitely the weakest. And even though I said that we've seen some buying in NASDAQ, so for instance, look into this volume signature right here. There is a definitive increase in the volume signature in the area of the support. What happens during this buying? There is definitely some uh, rallies that we are observing, some lift that that buying provides, but it doesn't really overcome the most important bar to us, which is this. This level, level is still not uh, taken over. Uh, there were quite a few attempts, there were quite a few touches, and yet we're still under. So with this, uh, uh, not only this is the weakest uh, uh, of them all in terms of the price structure and relative performance, but we're also very, very close to you know, the lowest prices in this trading range. So what does it mean? It means that if we have some kind of continuation to the downside, technology stocks are still uh, favorite stocks you know, for us to short. Uh, or not to be uh, fully exposed. 
you might find some areas in the technology that you think uh, are currently undergoing some kind of accumulation. And I see, you know, quite a few of those. Um, so does it mean that we are going to be rallying right away? We might be still in some kind of trading range for quite some time. Uh, so without any confirmation, I would most definitely uh, not be fully invested, not be, uh, ag um, you know, not, wouldn't be uh, trading aggressively to the upside. I would be initiating pro positions where my size would be diminished and my selection would be um, extremely, uh, extremely, uh, you know, pointing to specific areas of the technology. Okay, and I see that there are some questions there. So let me just finish this thought here and I'll come back to your questions, guys. So this is Russell and we're seeing the same structure, trading range, slightly different. And I want you to notice how we are actually residing a little bit below the low of that CPI bar right here. Uh, and we are currently in the down uh, trending channel. Uh, so we might be even looking at some kind of formation that is this right here, right? So we're seeing first stop in action, second stop in action, third stop in action. If the downtrend is to continue, could we come down here and have the last stop in action before we start going up? That could be a possibility. Could we uh, overcome and commit right away to the upside? That could be a possibility. I think this week is going to give us some kind of short term, a sense of short term directionality. Uh, so uh, it's going to be important to see how the week is going to end. And then the outperformer uh, for them all, the Dow, uh, look at the 200 moving average. This is this blue line right here. And look how not only did we overcome that and we also broke the downtrend in line, we had the capacity in the Dow to extend above and then spend so much time and still currently above that 200 moving average, which for institutional uh, investors and uh, traders is a very important uh, element of their technical analysis. Uh, analysis. Um, and uh, the rally that we have had is definitely a change of behavior rally. I mean, this is the best rally that we've seen in this whole downtrend. And we're seeing how the rally has increased. We've seen some buying behind it in the volume signature as well. The volume signature has expanded. The price is traveling up and we see an expansion of the daily spreads on the way up uh, and it breaks uh, certain downtrend and structures. Uh, so definitely looks bullish, but what do we need to have after the change of behavior? We need to have a test. And only after a successful test could we say that, yes, now we're confirming that this is an uptrend. Uh, so on the very short-term basis, uh, the last trading range was an upthrust suggests that there is some supply that is coming in, although on the Dow, it's not that significant. So we kind of waiting, what are we waiting for? If this is the test of this bar right here, and we're still in kind of like this rally mode uh, to continue, then we need to continue. And we need to continue to the upside. Um, another bullish scenario, yeah, we could still go down somewhat and then still recover and that still would be okay. We could probably recover, even uh, retrace even into this area, to the access line right here. That would be the lowest that I would, you know, think for the asset that was a stronger asset that was outperforming so much. Uh, and then the recovery from there. If we just go through the access line and we commit to the downside, then we're most likely we're gonna just retest the support. And this means that even though this is the strongest of them all, uh, we're still in some kind of downtrending environment. Okay, so let me see. 
how about a case of continuation to the downside and major capitulation from Mark? Yeah, well, I think that maybe I, I didn't clarify myself a little bit. Um, so when you look, let's say in 2008, so let's just look through this analog. Um, I wanted to look at this with Bruce uh, for our WMD class on Wednesday. So we could be um, thinking that um, you know we are somewhere here in this area. Uh, specifically, I wouldn't say exactly where. Uh, why? Because the structure is slightly different uh, from what we've seen lately in the markets. But Mark is referring to this increase of volatility period, and specifically the period where uh, we have a general capitulation, where smart institutions capitulated before that, uh, where composite man, uh, uh, you know, capitulated before that, and this period in 2008 was associated with selling of everything by everyone uh, with an idea that you want uh, all of your positions in cash, and basically you want a cash position. Uh, would it come to this? And I think that yes, it is possible. And that's why, again, I am extremely tentative uh, to give you my uh, prediction or prognostication. I am giving you scenarios of what could potentially happen and how I would be interpreting this if the price behaves one way or another. I would say that still my preferred uh, time frame for now to trade is on the intraday because you come in on the intraday, you don't commit to a higher time frame trend. And there is enough volatility, even currently, uh, to produce really good PL for the day. And then, uh, if I am swing trading, then I'm swing trading for a shorter duration. I'm not uh, holding on to my positions for a long time. And uh, currently, the long term portfolio is just basically on hold. Uh, I'm not necessarily, um, you know, exposed a lot in my long-term uh, portfolio like IRA or the hedge fund uh, where uh, you know uh, more than uh, uh, even 40 percent is committed uh, you know to the market so and we'll talk about this uh, type of you know tactical decisions on sizing on timing uh, on risk uh, especially in the practicum class okay let's go to some other uh, assets were 350. Uh, gold, uh, we've uh, talked so much about gold in the last semester. So we said that inability uh, to come to the all time high uh, was a sign of weakness in itself. Then we had a change of behavior, reaction, and the rallies that were extremely weak, suggesting that we're going to continue to the downside. So that was the call at the time. As we go down, we see an increase of the supply on the subsequent uh, reactions. And even though this looks like a really great rally right here, it still is confined within the uh, down trending channel. But we're seeing some emergence of the demand, which is suggestive that maybe at least at the minimum, we're going to have some kind of trading range uh, formation right here. We are in the trading range, and then the next piece of analysis came from the VSA. We were conducting our analysis of these three bars, and the last one uh, showed to us an expansion of the upward result. And with that, uh, we suggested that we are going to be in some kind of rally mode that not only is going to uh, take us and break the downtrend in channel, but also is going to touch and overcome temporarily. Uh, this automatic uh, rally high. And we did both. And look how the price extends above those um, uh, those areas of interest to us. Look at how supply is diminishing into the support. And we have um, a small spring type of situation here, which is suggestive that demand is uh, still capable of um, pushing the price up almost immediately after the initial commitment down. 
uh, or it rather attempt, intraday attempt to come in down and suggested that we're going to retest this high and go slightly higher. Uh, so extension of that was still bullish and now we're in some kind of uh, trading range which is uh, ascending triangle. So all of this right here in this area, if this was our change of behavior plus test, which suggested that we are going to go up, uh, the uh, continuation uh, of what has happened afterwards, ability of the price to be above the resistance and to spend a lot of time there uh, is suggestive that we are in a much more bullish environment currently in gold than in a bearish environment. Now, we still have some areas of the supply um, associated with the previous breakdowns. So here it is right here. So we are finding some supply that is coming in, increasing, and yet there is some absorption that we're seeing right here. So um, I would say the most immediate uh, thought here is just continuation to the upside, but I wouldn't be surprised if we also attempt him to go up and then coming back and kind of retesting this area right here before continuing to the upside. Or it, we are in some kind of much larger trading range. But for now, I would say that this is bullish and I would trade it as such, meaning that I would go to gold mining stocks, silver stocks, specifically silver is outperforming gold, and I would just look for candidates there. Okay, let's go to Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has been in the steady downtrend for quite some time. We've talked about the emergence of the demand uh, in the area of the stopping actions. Look at how the volume signature suddenly spiked into the beginning of November. And every time we had that, we had some kind of extension to the downside, a breakdown of sorts, right? So and you see how those breakdowns are expanding. What does the last breakdown do, right? Do we expand or do we decrease the result to the downside? We definitely see the decrease of the downward result. So on the increased attempt to push the price down where the effort to push the price down is increasing, we're seeing decreasing downward result. This is suggestive of only one thing and one thing only, that is emergence of the demand. And emergence of the demand could lead to a possible reversal or a change of behavior, or we could just be in some kind of consolidation in the trading range. We are in the consolidation in the trading range. And here again, as with the stock market, we need to note what is important to us, which levels are important. And I would say that this is the most important level. Again, like with the stock market, look at this area right here, uh, which is act, acted before as the support, now it's acting as a re major resistance. So 18.5, 18.6 uh, is extremely important. We will not have a bull market in Bitcoin uh, if we will not commit above this level. That's the level for us to overcome. Uh, so therefore, all of our analysis is still to the downside until until we see some kind of commitment to the upside above 18.6. Not only that, we want to see a specific, a specific character of this commitment. We want to see the expansion of the upward result. We want to see the ability of the price to overcome this breakdown in a very decisive uh, type of way. Uh, so expansion of demand and expansion of upward result. Okay, let's go to oil. For those of you who trade oil, I would definitely suggest going to our Twitter, um, and I've discussed it a lot in our classes as well. Uh, right here, specifically around this area, I made a call that we are in the distributional formation. and that we only need to complete that distribution by going into the upthrust, uh, in this case, local upthrust. 
And we've discussed how we had this climactic run, stop in action, change of behavior, um, and then the apex formation with a lot of inactivity. And we, we're going to talk about that as one of the distributional patterns, and that was the whole key for me to identify this as the distribution. It's those characteristics. And then um, and the call was not only the distribution, the call was also to touch $60 as we go down. Well, we've touched 70. We definitely did not go below 70. I would be satisfied with number six, uh, uh, you know, uh, as the first uh, number for the current price. And I would say like, yeah, that was a good call. Um, let's just say like one half of this was done correctly and one half of this was done maybe like we're still waiting, still waiting, would it be? Um, so as the downtrend has started, we are seeing a lot of weakness, especially in this area right here. Please note how the price is spending a lot of time in the lower part of the down channel rather than in the upper part. So that's weakness in itself. Then the support area is also extremely important. We are seeing the structure here. This is a trading range, which is the redistribution trading range. And we're seeing how a lot of the time price spends in the sign of weakness, suggesting still that we're in the downtrend, suggesting continuation to the downside. A change of behavior uh, that came exactly to the point that we identify as our access line. Again, extremely important line right there. And uh, we are starting to analyze it as our trade range. So what do we see? A test, completion of phase A, and currently I would say we are either in phase B. Yeah, I would say that we are probably still in phase B or, uh, and I still would treat this as a redistribution to be confirmed or to fail. So what are, we, what are we seeing here? Currently, we're in, in, at the level of the support in a smaller trading range right here. And so far, and obviously this is the whole day's volume, volume signature, but we're seeing how there is less buying, less selling. We need to go into the new year uh, and to see if there's going to be some kind of buying or continuation of selling, right? But so far, on the way down, we're seeing diminishing rally and still expansion of selling on the way down. And that's the predominant trend that, uh, and the downtrend since, the, since June is to the downside as well. So I'd say that um, predominant trade, trend is still to the downside, intermediate trend is um, to the downside. Another intermediate trend right here is in the trading range. And currently we are in the upswing right here. Uh, close to the resistance. So would we have some kind of reversal? Then we would be expecting the price to go and retest the support uh, or continue the downtrend altogether. Okay. Uh, and I think that's it. Yeah, we're at four o'clock, so I'm going to stop here with the market analysis. Let's see some of the questions that you have. Where is the selling climax? Uh, sorry, is asking uh, in NASDAQ. Okay, so there are quite a few. I mean, if you want to follow the whole downtrend, we could definitely say that this is the first climactic action, which is the intermediate uh, selling climax. Then this right here, I would identify as our second selling climax. And then the current trading range, you might be thinking that around this area we have some kind of third uh, intermediate selling climax. Uh, and you might ask, well, isn't the selling climax only one? Uh, you could have multiple formations in the downtrend or in the uptrend that, let's say, uh, have some stopping action because each consolidation would have a stopping point where the opposing force coming in or maybe the current force is deteriorating so much that it cannot move the price in that direction anymore. Uh, so therefore, all of those I would consider uh, selling climaxes, but 
those might not be the terminal cell inclinances. The terminal cell inclinance to a trend is the last cell inclinance before we go into the consolidation of, of the different bias. And we still yet uh, to see that. We don't see any confirmations of that. Uh, we just see in stopping actions, but you know, uh, they don't bring anything. Um, do Wyckoff principles apply to smaller time frames as used in swing and day trading from Jerry? Yes, absolutely. You could apply Wyckoff method on as high time frame as the yearly chart, monthly chart, weekly chart, daily chart. You could apply Wyckoff principles um, on uh, intraday uh, time frames as well, including the tick data too, if you want to go that low. Okay, next question. Does seasonal contraction of volume have any significance or treat it as any other period from Jason? And obviously, the, uh, Jason refers here to the holiday volume signature. And I would say, uh, yes, usually um, we should expect the volatility to go down uh, during you know, Christmas and New Year time. And what do we do then? How do we analyze this? You look at the price. What does the price do during this period? Even though we have fewer traders, but what does the price do? Because ultimately the price will be the final uh, you know, determination for us as to uh, the current buys or the trend. And we kind of see what the price has done during the whole day. Still more to the downside uh, and slightly um, consolidating. Okay, and then from Sa, uh, you know, what is the bias of the current uh, trading range? I'm assuming this one right here. So this is how simplistically I'm thinking about this Sa. Uh, the major trend is to the downside. The more local trend right here, what is this? Lower highs, lower lows, still to the downside. And therefore, I'm treating this as a redistribution to be confirmed or to fail. With that, how would we confirm uh, that this is a redistribution? Commitment to the downside. And how would it fail? As I said, commitment above 18.5 or 18.6, where we come and then we commit with some kind of strength. And that's what I'm looking for. Do I trade Bitcoin right now? No, there is no reason to. I mean, look at this volatility. I'm like, I don't know, maybe there are some intradays, ins and outs there, but I'm not going to even be concerned about that. So I'm just waiting for a much higher time frame confirmation. And then from there, once it's confirming one way or another, um, I'm, I will be trading that. Okay, that's it for our market update. Again, we're going to be doing this every week for about 30, 40 minutes. Uh, if you are interested in a much more detailed analysis uh, of the market each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific together with Bruce Frazier, and I would absolutely recommend Bruce's work uh, on stockcharts.com. Uh, he is a blogger on stockcharts.com. I know he writes everything about Wyckoff methodology. Uh, please visit Stock Charts and uh, visit Bruce's blogs. Uh, you could read them as a book, so I highly recommend that. Uh, and it's actually under our required uh, reading material for this course. But each Wednesday at 3 p.m., Bruce and I, we go through all of the markets. We go through the sectors, through the groups, uh, into stocks. Uh, we do our top bottom selection analysis. We talk a lot about the markets from different perspectives. Uh, and um, sometimes we look at the students' charts, uh, the ones that are being submitted. And we also have the anatomy of the trade, an exercise where we pick the stock and we follow it. Also, uh, for those of you who are interested in the uh, US market, stock market, that is, uh, we do have the Wyckoff Market Report, which is being uh, created on a weekly basis by John Iskian. Uh, uh, John uses the stock charts uh, scanning engine 
to produce for us a weekly watch list. And the uniqueness of John Scans is that John Scans based on the contextual wake of events, whether those are sprints or upthrusts or backups or breakdowns. Uh, and every week we could see the data points of, of those events. And we could even make some kind of assessment and judgment of the overall health of the market just based on those reports. So please check this out on our website. All right, with that, I think we're done with this big, big part of the market update. Let's talk about Richard D. Wyckoff uh, himself, who he was, why uh, you know it is important for us to talk about him. And I want you to uh, I want to refer you to the article in Stock Charts and Commodities, which is called. Uh, Richard DeMille Wyckoff, uh, it has five parts to it, and it was written by uh, an absolute uh, uh, you know, uh, expert uh, on uh, Wyckoff biography, as also other uh, traders uh, like Jesse Livermore. Um, her name is Stella Asoba, and uh, Stella was very kind um, to attend uh, one of our best of Wyckoff conferences. And uh, she presented there. Uh, all of our best of Wyckoff conferences are free. And you could come to our website and actually in the on-demand section of the website, find those conferences, go to that presentation by Stella and listen uh, to her presentation. But also, uh, and most definitely, read her article. Um, you know, again, five parts, but you know, it's a fascinating read. Uh, it has little to do with the methodology itself, but it definitely gives you a really good perspective of who Wyckoff was. All right, well, who was here and why is it important to us to know who he was? Uh, he was a student of the market. Uh, he was an editor of the magazine of Wall Street, which he founded in 1907, and which existed until 1934. Uh, unfortunately, I would say, uh, as much as I admire him uh, from the perspective of uh, a teacher, an educator who brought so much uh, knowledge and training to public who codified the rules of engagements by large stock operators of his time like Jesse Livermore, uh, James Keen, um, JP Morgan uh, and others. Uh, his worst trade was his second marriage and uh, that led to the divorce and then his wife uh, inherited almost everything uh, that belonged to him, including the magazine of Wall Street. So uh, the, it existed until 1974, and then it discontinued. Um, but uh, Wyckoff was uh, able to leave uh, a big body of knowledge for us, whether it came from, uh, let's say, the magazine of Wall Street itself, or uh, from the ticker, uh, which was the publication uh, in the uh, early of last century uh, that he published where uh, routinely he would talk to uh, big traders at the time uh, where he would discuss you know what the market is doing where he would um, you know show the public the way how he analyzes the market and obviously quite a lot of books that he left us with um, and there is usually a question, which book should I read? Which book by Wyckoff should I read? As if you're the beginner or intermediate trader, I probably would suggest that you wouldn't read his books. Uh, and here's the reason why. I think that his books are not necessarily constructed in such a sequence that gives you an understanding uh, of the steps that you need to take in order for you to trade 
uh, Wyckoff methodology. That's number one. Secondly, uh, you know, the writings are obviously outdated. So I would suggest to start with the more a modern interpretation and adaptation of the Wyckoff method, and then come back to his original books once you're an intermediate advanced student and read those uh, when you already uh, feel comfortable. All right, so one of the most important works that Wyckoff left, left behind in 1934 when he passed away in Sacramento was his course. And in a way, his divorce kind of pushed him to create this course because the course was created, you know, uh, several years before his passing. And that came after the divorce uh, when the Wall St uh, Street Journal, uh, the, Wall St uh, the magazine of Wall Street was taken away from him. Uh, so he created this course and uh, this is a foundational work for us. Again, uh, it's outdated. Uh, it reads a little bit heavy. Uh, so I again would suggest reading the modern adaptation first and then coming back uh, to this work. Uh, this is in the public domain. Uh, so you are welcome to find it on the internet, download, read it. Let's talk now about the heuristic that uh, Richard D. Wyckoff introduced to us, which is the composite operator or the composite man. So the composite operator, and this is the article from the magazine of Wall Street by Wyckoff himself, uh, the composite man. Uh, the composite man. It is he who makes the market. And indeed, we know that it's the institutions that uh, create trends in the marketplace. It's not the public that creates uh, the trends. It's the collection of big money. And where is the big money? Uh, is it in the public? No. Uh, is it um, uh, among the institutions? Yes. So therefore, let's just read the definition on who is the composite man and where can it be found written by Wyckoff himself. He consists of some 2 million personalities scattered over the face of Earth. So I would say maybe at that time, this was you know the number of traders or maybe the number of institutional traders. Some of his components parts are richer, more powerful than others. Okay, so here right away we would be thinking some kind of institutional traders. Some are noted for their foresight, intuition, shrewdness, conservatism. Okay, maybe analysts. Some for the dashing, daring, reckless quality of their moves, speculators. These millions of personalities form one omniscient who sways the market, crushing those who do not know and will not learn how to benefit by him. So I'm gonna uh, put here weak hands. And I deliberately do not put public in here. Why? Well, because as we're going to study today, the weak hands, as the strong hands as well, is not necessarily consistent only of uh, public hands. It's also institutional. So under the weak hands, we're going to be thinking here, weak institutional hands and weak public hands. And one might ask, well, how could institution be weak hands? Don't they have a lot of money? Don't they have a lot of research? But you know, they make wrong decisions as well. And for us, the definition of the strong hands versus weak hands is in the ability uh, to be on the correct side of the price cycle. Now, I also go into discussion here, especially with my uh, you know, more advanced students about you know the composite man what it really means because we were taught that 
the composite man is just all of the institutions and that obviously was incorrect so some of the institutions could be weak hands then uh, another um, another idea that was not brought up to our attention when I was studying Wyckoff methodology was that it's not just people with uh, specific positions. It's also analysts or even you could say TV anchors. You could say, you know, anybody who's influencing the price cycle itself with some kind of message could be one of those uh, personalities of the composite man. And we just use this heuristic where we're saying that the smart money or the money on the correct side of the price cycle, these are the uh, market participants that are creating those major trends. Um, and this is the money that we wanna see on the chart. And the composite man usually plans and executes some kind of campaign. Uh, so institutional money are not necessarily a short-term time frame type of money. I mean, obviously some of them have some kind of, you know, uh, auto bots trading, or they have a bunch of traders, you know, that do more short-term trading. But their short-term trading are mostly going to be associated with the increase of their uh, positions coming in into the position, increasing the size of the position, or short-term taking profits and trimming, scaling out of the position. That's their short-term uh, uh, action in the marketplace. Everything else uh, is a long-term campaigns that sometimes is being conducted beyond one year. Um, you know, what they would call, you know, the positions for the, uh, for the business cycle which could last again, you know, from a year to multiple years. And then of course, you think of uh, somebody like Warren Buffett who trades for decades, right? So he invests and holds the stocks for decades and decades. And uh, uh, that's what produces, uh, you know, that uh, famous 20% return per year, uh, uh, even with all of the down years that he has to go through. Uh, and we want to identify the steps, the footprints of this uh, composite men on the chart. And we'll talk about how would we see this. Okay, let's have a short break here. Uh, and the short break is going to be devoted to our bias game. Uh, so you could, uh, what is the bias game? The bias game is just basically the exercise where you're given a chart to analyze. Uh, it is more time than not is a trading range and uh, just based on uh, your analysis then you will be able to vote let's say you can vote on Twitter or on our website those are the places where you could find the bias game our Twitter handle at Wyckoff Analysis our website uh, wyckoffanalytics.com and um, we have a full community that goes through this game on the weekly basis. There's so much participation in that. Uh, as I mentioned, we uh, analyze each bias games in the WTC2 course. That's also a big deal for us. We want to understand uh, how do we analyze, where do we make the mistakes and so on and so forth. And then we give you our solution that we want you to study. We give you our Wyckoff story, we give you the solution itself, we give you the labeling. Um, and I would absolutely highly recommend uh, for anyone to start following the bias game on the weekly basis. I mean, it's completely free. Uh, why not to study 30 minutes per week, uh, print out the bias game, do your analysis, then go uh, on Friday, get the solution and study the solution and compare it uh, to your uh, to your results. Uh, and a lot of students do this, and this is how improvement is being made. All right, let's continue with our price structural analysis. So our main objectives for the price structural analysis are 
first of all, observe how the market participants uh, behave uh, on the chart. And then we want to make the correct deductions about their behaviors and uh, behind their intentions. And then we want to trade alongside this smart money, right? So obviously the question becomes is to how to identify the smart money on the chart. Well, obviously that would be in the volume signature itself, right? So for instance, when we have a significant increase in the volume signature, we will know that there is a lot of exchange of shares between institutions uh, on that particular bar. And then obviously the price itself, right? So for instance, price relative to the absolute trend, and then also, uh, uh, relative to the relative trend. We also could see the presence uh, of institutions in the long-term volume signature and then long-term price action. So this is in short how we would identify what, uh, those smart money uh, footprints. Where do we start our analysis? So we're starting our analysis with the price cycle model, that's number one. Then we're going into the behavioral market analysis just to understand uh, what market participants are uh, engaged in the market right now. Uh, then we're doing our trend analysis. Then we're going through our Wyckoff analysis, which is going to be, uh, which is going to start with the change of behavior, change of character, and then going into the uh, Wyckoff uh, phases and events uh, during the consolidations. Uh, that's from the top down that's the way how we would analyze the market so let's look at the price cycle and let's uh, uh, start familiarizing ourselves how does the price actually moves why does it go into consolidation why does it go into the trends uh, what originates that type of behavior and you're seeing the very simplistic price cycle here where we see the area of the accumulation area of the distribution and then uh, in between them, you have a trending environment. So here is our uptrend. And then after the distribution, we have our downtrend. But this is obviously a bird's view, right? Uh, let's talk about specifically what happens during those areas. So during the accumulation area, our first sign of intelligent buying could be found uh, during the climactic run to the downside into the selling climax area. We could see that the volume signature is going to drastically increase, suggesting what? Suggesting that there is a presence of the opposing force, demand. Therefore, there should be some kind of stopping action that could lead to a change of behavior that would suggest the trading range environment. Once we're in the trading range, then we're going to be concerned about the bias analysis, timing, and character of the price coming out of that trading range. Is it going to be a continuation or is it going to be a reversal? And as we go through the trading range, let's say this is an accumulation trading range, there will be specific characteristics that we would be looking for. Some change of behavior, change of character in price structure. We would look also at Wyckoff events. And there are specific events that are going to be associated with each wike of phase. And as we go through this whole analysis of the trading range, we could start seeing some changes as to the current trend uh, or the trading range itself. And we come to the area that institutional traders usually refer as the emergence of a new trend. A lot of their systems and models are based on the emergence of a new trend. Whether this is something simplistic as 52 weeks high, uh, or maybe uh, some kind of uh, relative or absolute outperformance, um, we're gonna be using our volume and spread analysis skills, uh, uh, swing analysis, structural analysis, price and volume analysis, like a phase analysis to identify that change of behavior and change of character.
in price action to identify the emergence of the trend. And this is all gonna be, and it's gonna coincide with institutional trend followers position opening. This is gonna be the area where we're gonna be opening our positions. And then as we go through the trading range, we're gonna experience different type of events, something like reaccumulation and then continuation with the trend and there might be some multiple areas of the reaccumulation and then we're going to come to the conclusion of the uptrend which is also uh, uh, going to conclude with the climactic run into the stop in action buying climax in this case uh, where the value investors as they've done at the climactic action in the downtrend and they were buyers value buying they would be value sellers at the terminal climactic action or even at the intermediate climactic action where they would be just taking some profit at the emergence of the trend we're going to be uh, looking at the number of institutional participations or participants to go up And that would be reflected also in the increase of the volume signature. And not only that, increase in the upward result. And we'll talk about the sign of strength and the backup as the final test at the level of the resistance before the price starts moving in the uptrend uh, with ease. Um, and I'm kind of giving you some previews of the logic that we would use in our analysis. Obviously, behind this logic is a bunch of skills that we need to create. Uh, we need to understand what is it exactly that we're looking for. What are the wake of events? What are the wake of phases? How do we identify those? What are the characteristics? Uh, what is, let's say, uh, you know, a change of behavior on the way out? Uh, but uh, in a nutshell. Uh, this is how uh, simple it is. So let's go into more details uh, of the price cycle. So now we're seeing the same price cycle, but we're seeing also uh, wake of events and we're seeing wake of phases on the schematic. So a uh, couple of things here for us to observe. First of all, every time a trend converts itself into some kind of consolidation, a trading range. We are going to have attempts to stop that are going to fail, attempts to stop that are going to work. Those are usually going to be climactic events. A change of behavior that is going to be suggestive of the switch of one environment, the downtrend, into another consolidation. And then we're gonna go through the phases during the consolidation and each phase is gonna have some kind of event that we could observe and then we could deduce that we are in the specific phase. And I will not promise you that for on each chart, you will be able to do that. I'm not able to go to each consolidation and say, exactly what the bias is or exactly where we are but with time as you practice you definitely will become better and better and better um, and one promise that i do have to all of the students of uh, somebody who's going to be signing up for this course today is that by uh, usually the second third months into the course and obviously after the course you will come out out of the course uh, fill in that now you understand the price structural analysis. You will know how the price uh, uh, potentially could be moving, uh, how it's going to create some kind of, you know, either trending structure or uh, consolidation structures. And your uh, skills of reading the chart will just, you know, multiply times over. Uh, and that's what we usually hear from our students, even during the course. Again, usually, you know, the end of the second month, uh, the third month for sure, 
Uh, usually people would say like, I see market differently. Like I look at the market, I look at the, at the charts and uh, I see a lot of those white of patterns that we've talked about. Uh, and this is the, the goal of this course. It's just to create that type of ability to see things for what they are. So uh, as we go through the accumulation and we are, uh, are starting with the uh, stopping action, the climactic action, after the preliminary support, which always fails, um, we're seeing the first signs of intelligent time. And again, usually it's going to be associated with the increase in the volume signature that comes from the value buy. Those, uh, <clears throat> those are the market participants that we're going to refer as the CO, composite operator or the uh, CM composite map. And then uh, during the consolidation, the sentiment is going to shift back and forth from uh, bearish to bullish and then to bearish again, especially into phase C, which is where the price drifts down behind uh, non-participation uh, by the CEO at that moment, creates some kind of short-term value and short-term liquidity event, and the CEO comes back and buys again, supporting the price. Uh, slightly below the support level or slightly above the support level that pushes the price up and then at the beginning uh, of the uptrend which we again call this area the emergence of the uptrend in phase d this is where the institutional trend followers um, institutional uh, uh, trend followers could, could also be institutional uh, long-term momentum traders are coming in into this position and establishing this position uh, with you know significant first portion uh, and that pushes the price up in such way that produces that change of behavior um, into a sign of strength and then the final test the backup action at the area of the resistance and the confirmation of the established uptrend comes with the final breakout local breakout uh, above the area of the uh, backing up action. Once we're done with the uptrend, the logic of how institutions operate in the distributional area is going to be somewhat the same. Uh, first, as I mentioned, the value sellers are going to come and they're going to sell into the strength of the uptrend. So therefore, we are going to have first attempt to stop uh, the uptrend with the emergence of the supply that will fail. Then we're going to have a second emergence of the supply on the climactic action that will stop temporarily the uptrend from uh, continuation. In some cases, we'll have the structures that are going to be upsloping structures that are going to remind us of the uptrends with higher highs, higher lows. In some cases, it's going to be more horizontal or even deteriorating price structure. And again, those are just variations. The logic is going to stay the same, but variations on how the price in the trading range specifically unfolds is going to be different. And we'll study all of those. And during this area where, let's say, in, during the distribution, when the value sellers are selling, they're going to be selling into strength. So every time the price comes into the area of the resistance, they will try to sell at the uh, higher prices possible uh, rather than in the lower part of the trading range, of the distributional trading range. In the lower part of the distributional trading range, it's the weak hands that are going to be operating, uh, and they will be the buyers at that point of time. And that's how the transition from strong hands uh, into the weak hands is going to happen during the distribution. Our goal is to identify a change of behavior on the way out. It's to identify the reaction that is one of the largest reaction that produces some kind of commitment below the support level. And that is being followed by a weak rally, which basically tells us that weak hands are now exhausted. They've come in into this position and there are not that many of the weak hands left to push the price back into the resistance. Usually after that, we see some kind of 
uh, breakdown or capitulation by institutions that are coming out of this position based on the uh, uh, breakdown uh, below specific support level. And of course, life is much more complicated. The markets are definitely much more complicated than a simple a price cycle model. So here is an extension of that with even more details. And as you could see, I have the traffic light here, uh, the red, the yellow, and green. So I'm dividing the whole trading range into three portions. Um, the first part of the trading range is all about stopping. What are we stopping? The previous trend. Uh, then going into phase B, yellow portion of the trading range, we are preparing, or what are we doing here? We're building causality, we're changing the sentiment, we're exhausting supply and demand at the same time. And then in the yellow part, which is our phase C, phase D, we are absorbing the last elements of the supply that is left and that pushes the price in the change of behavior way uh, into the sign of strength. And then uh, we are having the final test as a backup action at the level of the resistance. And every trading range goes through this, whether it's the accumulation or distribution, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna have the same type of uh, phases uh, or parts to the trading range where there is a stopping, preparation, and then you know emergence of the new trend uh, type of parts. Um, we obviously could talk about the phases as well, and we will. So uh, I will give you the definition of the phases, the characteristics with the white events in the next session, at least for the accumulation. And we'll spend uh, two to three sessions just talking about accumulation, uh, uh, distribution, reaccumulation and redistribution, how those should look like, what elements they should contain, and so on and so forth. And obviously, with the price cycle, as I mentioned, you might have multiple uh, air consolidations that are reaccumulations or redistributions in the whole uh, price cycle. So here, if we are talking about a selling climax in this area, a selling climax in this area, then if this is, a true accumulation, this would be a selling climax, which is the terminal selling climax. Just referring to that uh, question by Saar, I believe. All right. Let's go look at some examples. So this is a huge price cycle, and I don't even have all of the data here. So we're stopping here somewhere in the middle of 2019 before uh, COVID has happened. But this is a monthly Apple chart, and we're seeing that we've been since 1987 in a pretty prolonged consolidation. And why one might say, well, is it truly all accumulation? And I would say that you probably should recognize here a different parts of this trading range that has uh, elements of accumulation in the distribution. So for instance, up to this point, I would say that the bias here for us still would be a reaccumulation. Once we go into this area right here, we're seeing deterioration of the price action. So therefore, this area right here would be labeled by us as a local distribution. Then we're seeing a major sign of strength and behind the market uh, decline. Uh, we're seeing the decline in Apple as well. Uh, so just the gravity of the market is so big, uh, it doesn't spare even the leadership uh, during the bear markets. And you know, if anything, 2022, 20, uh, it was the year like this, where you could see, especially in the technology sector, uh, that even the leadership stocks are being sold and being sold aggressively, quickly, uh, and that, you know, their downtrends produce, you know, quite significant drawdowns. Uh, but I would say that even with that middle part to that, the next section was all about accumulation. This is where in 1996, 97, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Steve Jobs coming back, 
uh, with the plan for the whole product line where he basically says we want uh, you know to have the uh, eight to ten billion in revenue per quarter how do we do this we need to create this product line here it is and then institutions by listening to him what he wants to create what do they do look at the volume signature and compare that to the previous area uh, where let's say Steve Jobs was on the sidelines they are definitely doing something. They are present. Institutions are present at this time. Next question for us, what are they doing? And we could guess or speculate what they do by looking at the price action. Pretty big rally. And then if not cons consider uh, you know, the market decline that we have had, consolidation afterwards bullish this is not the bearish pattern high highs high lows upward spread is increasing volume is increasing demand is increasing um, high low into the backing up action into the uh, last point of support trading range and then the recovery so on the recovery we have the confirmation that indeed this was a bullish pattern and that now we're going to be in some kind of uptrend Please note what happens afterwards. The volume signature increases even more. So what does it mean? It means usually that uh, institutions now are buying on the way up. And I know this is not a part of the methodology, but I usually uh, give you guys uh, you know, the references to the accumulations that are a part of the uptrend. Those are usually one of the best uh, long-term setups for us. Why? Because if institutions wants to be in the stock and they are willing to keep investing in it since 2003 to 2009, and I would say even this area inclusive to 2013, because the volume signature is still pretty high, then they believe that this is going to be a very, very long-term trend and they want to participate in that type of business cycle, uh, long-term secular trends in the leadership stock. And that's why uh, since the uh, early 2000s, uh, a majority of the money managers wanted to be in Apple and wanted to hold on to this uh, position for a long time as their clients would always be asking am I in Apple are we in Apple uh, so this is just an example of the um, outstanding leadership and you could see here that even though we have a secular causality and we have a secular effect um, we are also seeing much smaller cyclical um, price cycles where we are seeing the cyclical causality either accumulation or a distribution accumulation or a distribution accumulation or a distribution and it goes on and on uh, we also see in cyclical effects right so smaller uptrends smaller downtrends smaller uptrends smaller downtrends and so on and so forth and that's how price unfolds uh, in consolidation and in the uptrend you have to have someone who takes on a lot of supply from weekends, puts it in the world, does not come with that supply to the market and um, you know introduce the supply to the market, but holds on to that, does not allow uh, the shares to be traded. So those shares effectively um, is not for sale and not for buy anymore. And with that, as supply goes down, the uptrend is unfolding. And with the additional buying, then you have not only sustainability of the trend, but you also have some kind of over demand for the specific stock like Apple, and that produces the increase in the relative strength. And that attracts institutions even more because ultimately majority of the institutions are gonna be all about uh, absolute and relative returns. Okay. All right, another quick break. Uh, so for uh, those of you who are not familiar with Wyckoff Analytics, uh, you could sign up for our weekly free newsletter. 
and usually during uh, during the week we consolidate some of the uh, calls that we're making during the week so you could just easily read through those uh, we usually show you the latest uh, blogs or, or videos that are being posted and any other type of announcements that we have so completely free uh, YouTube channel also is completely free and we have quite a lot of videos there um, we have the videos on the current market we have the legacy videos where we made some presentations uh, on different topics. We have the anatomy of the trade, we have the crypto analysis, we have scanning and so on and so forth, some interviews. So go check it out. And then uh, Twitter, obviously free as well. So all of this is free and we are publishing a lot of content for free just for you guys to either use it or just to see what we do. Uh, so I would most definitely recommend Twitter if you wanna follow the bias game. I would uh, recommend the YouTube channel, you know, for those of you who would like to kind of like uh, go deeper into our videos and the newsletter is just to what's happening currently in our community. All right, quick question. Uh, from Lee, which author for Wyckoff Method do you recommend? So for the beginner, I would start with Hank Pruden and his book, uh, The Three Skills of Top Trading. Three Skills of Top Trading. Uh, specifically chapters three to seven. Uh, then as we go to, let's say, intermediate one level, uh, Jim's Forte's Anatomy of the Trade, of the Trading Range. Intermediate two, and I just refer to this level as we have them in our education. Intermediate two level, uh, Bruce's blogs. Uh, advanced one level, David Weiser's book. Trades about to happen. And advanced two level, stop reading everything. Stop reading books. And the only thing that I want you to do at this level is charts. And I'm not gonna go into like big details of why at this level I want you to stop reading. Uh, but I'm just going to quickly tell you that I've been teaching this material for quite some time, for over, like, what, 12 years now. Uh, so this is cycle number, I think, 37, if I'm not mistaken, that I'm teaching this. So each cycle is 15 sessions. So you can imagine, I mean, like, and this is just one class, but I also uh, teach WTC2 class, WMD. So I teach about, you know, uh, three classes per week. Uh, I'm sorry, not three, uh, four classes per week for sure. And sometimes five classes. Uh, so you could imagine I've been around, right? So I've seen people, I've seen students, I've seen traders. Um, and what I see a lot uh, in the student body, different types of personalities come to trading. Uh, one of the personality is kind of like this bright uh, individual that fails and withdraws from the market by reading more. And I call them uh, knowledge hoarders. And if you recognize yourself in my words, um, please consider my advice. Uh, knowledge hoarders 
it's just basically doing the same as the person who, let's say, has a loss and emotionally withdraws from trading uh, either altogether or just uh, for the period of time. Uh, the knowledge hoarders justify their emotional withdrawal from the mistakes and from analyzing those mistakes and from correcting those mistakes by going to more knowledge. Uh, they go either to another methodology or they become expert in this methodology. I most definitely had those personality traits myself and which led me to teaching uh, this material. So I know this material in and out, I know uh, the material in depth, uh, but originally that was my kind of like emotional withdrawal. Uh, so the key there is to understand that this is what you're doing. The key is to understand that you don't have to read 15 books per semester like I've done you know, early on, you know, 25 years ago in my career. Um, and it's useful. If you're a beginner intermediate trader, for sure, read as much as you want. I usually say for the beginners, read everything on technical analysis. For the intermediate traders, I usually say read only on the specific subject. So for instance, if you're studying Wyckoff method, read on Wyckoff method. And then for the advanced traders, I say that your goal now is to trade and to make money. It's not to hoard knowledge. It's not to know more. You could make money with the moving average. That's how simple trading could be if you know exactly how to use that in, in terms of not just the analysis, but profitability. Um, so at the level of the practicum, I basically tell our students, you know, stop reading books, stop reading other people's thoughts and create your own thoughts by going to the charts and analyzing the charts. That's number one. Secondly, practice, simulate a uh, life trade and then uh, go through the post analysis of your trades you will get more information from that than from any other source. No book in the world could tell you, if you read the book, what kind of mistake you are making. There could be some generalities, but specifically related to you, those books will never address that. So something out of kind of like a teaching arsenal here you might agree with me you might disagree with me but if i encouraged you today to look into yourself honestly without any subjective pre, uh, preconceptions of how great you are and in a lot of cases i meet people that i imply exactly that and i'm not disagreeing with that but i'm saying that even people with a lot of knowledge have a lot of problems executing that knowledge uh, by trading the charts. So with that, hopefully, Lee, that was satisfactory. And again, now you know um, what books to read or not to read. Okay, let's continue. Uh, let's go into the behavioral market analysis. Um, so here, uh, the price cycle is just showing uh, the extreme points of fear or excitement, right? So at the end of the downtrend, the extreme point of fear and therefore subsequent capitulation will be associated with weak hands. Whereas the strong hands are gonna have, uh, are gonna exhibit the first signs of intelligent accumulation. On the way out of the trading range, we're gonna see the accumulation by early institutional trend adopters those as i said are institutional trend follow followers and then uh throughout the whole trading range the weak hands are going to be exhausted by ups and downs uh, they're going to be exhausted by the losses and this is where their withdrawal is going to happen emotionally they're going to say like i can't do this anymore uh get me out and at that point of time they are taking the supply out of the market and behind the CO buying and the institutional trend followers buying 
the price starts to change the behavior and starts uptrending. And kind of the same process happens during the distributional area, right? So first we see the first signs of uh, intelligent distribution by strong hands. Those are usually going to be in the area of the climactic run with the stop in action, with the change of behavior reaction uh, that shows not just the emergence of the supply, not just the stop in action, but also ability to produce the best reaction in the uptrend. And at the same time, extreme point of excitement by weak hands. Uh, why? Well, because the weak hands are starting to participate in the uptrend usually after one half of the uptrend has already unfolded. The market has advertised the uh, uptrend on the tape and weak hands I see in that clearly and they want to come and they want to participate. This uh, aligns everyone. This last part of the trend aligns the CO, aligns the institutional trend followers and weekends into one force. And usually because of that, we're going into this speculation in this part of the uptrend. This is where the price extends with ease, with a lot of momentum, with a lot of gaps, with a lot of uh, spread increases and so on and so forth. The money is made very easily. Uh, I would probably say, okay, maybe 2017 uh, is a good example of that. Uh, just to think about the overall market and obviously many, many examples where we have some kind of climactic stupid run to the upside. And as the CO sells, the price stops first and then goes into a trading range. And with that, the institutional trend followers are losing two things. They are losing absolute return and relative performance. And what do they do with the stocks or with any type of assets? It could be a crypto asset, it could be futures. What do we, they do with the uh, uh, assets that are um, on the losing side of the absolute return and relative outperformance? They start selling those, trimming them first, then selling them, and then capitulating completely. And we could see how during the distributional areas, how the price starts to deteriorate. First, very marginally, maybe into a minor sign of weakness. Then with the last attempt to go up, uh, there is a much more profound uh, type of reaction that we could have and demand does not come in. And then they start giving up on the way down. As they could be buyers on the way up, they could be sellers on the way down as well. And that's why on the breakdowns, we usually have gaps and we usually have volume increases. At the same time, the quote unquote value buying by weak hands is happening during the distributional area at the area of the support. And that's what does not allow right away the price to go down. And obviously it's not just the weak hands that are supporting, but it's more that the institutions are not selling and selling and selling and selling. They are selling, stopping, selling, stopping, because they want to sell at the top of the trading range rather than at the bottom uh, where the weak hands operate. And this process goes on and on and on. And it just, if you study this process and you could see this process on the chart, this is what's going to allow you uh, to uh, uh, participate on the correct side of the price cycle. Well, let's look at the behaviors here by the market participants. So we're talking about strong hands and weak hands. The strong hands during the accumulation area where the weak hands are so emotionally exhausted with the downtrend, where they're losing money, the strong hands actually will be buying as value investors and traders as the price falls. They also will be buying on the way up. I mentioned institutional trend followers. This is the emergence of the uptrend. Their models are gonna jump in and they're gonna be saying like the trend is unfolding now, get in and then hold on to the whole uptrend. And at some point they will become inactive. 
And during this inactive phase by the institutions, the weak hands will be buying on the way up. This is the only area where weak hands are actually profiting from the price movement. Kind of ironic, very sad, but that's the reality of it. And it's all rooted into our human beings emotionality, where we are protecting ourselves on the way down, we are selling, right? Because as species, we need to protect ourselves first. Survival comes first. And then the weak hands will be making money when everything is known, where the uptrend is already advertised. The CEO is going to be selling as the price rallies, and then the institutional trend followers will be capitulating on the way down, producing that price deterioration in the distributional area and on the way down whereas weak hands will be buying as price uh, falls uh, on the local basis. Let's see this as an example. So for instance, the same Apple month, monthly chart, we're seeing in the volume signature how big institutions are basically buying on the way up after the announcement that Steve Jobs is coming back, that Apple is gonna have a huge product line. And then they're still buying on the way up and they're still buying on the way up, maybe not as much, but still buying. And then they're becoming more inactive. They're just holding on to this position and they're riding the trend. And this could be seen on different time frames. This is Apple weekly, the same 1996, 97. We're seeing that in the trading range, there are some elements of buying for instance right here on the way down it looks very ominous with the gap down with the huge volume spike right here but look at what the price does it does gap but then it stops and tries to rally then it goes down and then it recovers pretty quick back above the support level and into the trading range and we see an increase of the demand those are the bullish characteristics of the emergence of the demand. And then we're seeing the same thing into uh, 1998, where the price reverses quickly and goes up uh, quickly through the whole trading range behind the increase of the demand signature. And because this is a relatively high a volume signature, we know that this is institutional signature. So what are they doing that the price is going up? The only thing that they could do is just to buy uh, for the price to go up. So here it is. And as the price goes up, volume is still increasing. Are they continue buying? Yes. Stop in action right here for a small consolidation, which is above the level of the resistance. So we're gonna call this a backup action after the sign of strength and then continuation. This is one of the high probability areas for us to enter this position. Why? Because the change of behavior has happened followed by the test as a backup action. And together, change of behavior and the test form a change of character in price action and price structure. So from the downtrend, into the consolidation, into the change of behavior and confirm testing. And this is a very easy piece for us to take and to profit from. And then obviously, uh, you know, they start selling. Here's the first selling that we're seeing. It doesn't produce the distributional area. It doesn't produce the reversal. And this is a very common mistake that I see with students where the emergence of supply is being interpreted automatically as the distribution. Doesn't necessarily have to be this way. You have to look at the result. You have to see some kind of creation of the distributional area before the price starts you know, going down. And we'll talk a lot about that. Okay, another time frame. This is a two hour time frame, And here we're seeing the same thing on the way down. Why does, the, why does the volume signature increases on both most to the downside? Well, because there is 
an opposing force that's coming in to sell it, and it's trying to stop the movement uh, of the downtrend. So therefore, there is some buying. Then there is some buying on the way up. And now that the supply has been observed uh, by, let's say, like this, you know, lower time frame uh, CO types and in institutional trend followers types on that lower time frame, now we're in the uptrend. Consolidation in the middle, and we're still coming out with some buying. And then we're seeing some of that initial selling that's coming in. Um, there might be a question here. Well, how do you see selling here? Okay, well, I'm seeing this from the volume signature increase. Whenever the volume signature is going to increase, you're always going to be thinking, and I will teach you how to think this way, that there is most definitely an increase in the opposing force to the current bias that we are in. And the if, uh, extent of the result is going to be extremely important. Do we produce this type of the result on the expansion of the supply? Or do we produce more limited result, which would be suggestive that not only supply is present there, but demand is uh, present there as well, and there is some absorption suggesting continuation. Again, something that we'll study. And then supply comes in again on another attempt uh, to uh, go to a high prices. And then as supply is becoming more and more present, we're seeing not just the stop in action, but we're seeing now the expansion of the downward result, which suggests that now we are in the change of behavior and therefore we might be changing the trend in the bias. So Wyckoff concepts are most definitely um, present on multiple timeframes, uh, on timeframes time frames that are monthly, weekly, yearly, and also on the, in the timeframes that are intraday timeframes. Let's talk now about the market participants. Who actually uh, are those uh, CO types and trend followers and so on and so forth. Uh, so our CO type, the composite man, uh, is usually going to be what we're going to call an institutional contrarian investor. And we also will call this a value investor. Now, the size of their position is just huge. And their time horizon is also very huge. It's just from a secular to a cyclical uh, time frame that they look at. They're looking for the long-term value, short-term liquidity to open their positions and to add to the positions. And to, uh, they look at the contrarian sentiment. So when the market is extremely bearish, they would be considering coming in and opening the position if their models are showing that this is the time to do so. Their limitations are also based on their size. They are too big. so they can't really in one day open the position and close the position. And that's probably their biggest uh, pitfall um, uh, as a market participant. They also do not like uh, a high turnover. Um, in my hash time um, work, I always was told that the less you trade, the better. You know, the turnover of your portfolio should not be um, high but it should be low uh, these are the requirements uh, for for the client so therefore their selection is going to be very very crucial tax implications and this is probably less relevant now than it was even you know, let's say like five seven years ago but they still will be considering uh, long-term tax implications against the short-term tax implications so they don't want to come in into the position today and then in three months they're going to sell it completely. They might trim it, but they might not sell it. That's just not their style. Their edge is obviously a long uh, time horizon, a long-term trends that they look at, and very, very deep knowledge of the market. They are visible on the chart with the extreme volume at the points of liquidity, uh, visible through the absolute and relative trends and long-term volume signature. Examples of the composite Man, composite operator, Warren Buffett, Pimco, uh, Black, BlackRock. 
Institutional trend followers, I would start thinking right away, hedge fund managers, registered investment advisors, pension funds, insurance companies, investment banks, mutual funds. Uh, those are also institutions and those are also CO types, but their models are predominantly going to be based on growth in a lot of cases on value, obviously. Their size is still going to be very big. Their time horizon is going to be uh, mostly cyclical, but sometimes secular as well. They're looking for the emergence of the trend. And this is what's interesting. That's kind of like, you know, the difference between a contrarian sentiment and the emergence of the trend. Uh, they want to also identify the break of that absolute or relative trend and to get out at that point completely. They're looking for the long-term value and short-term liquidity. Uh, their limitations is that they're driven by the performance matrix. So they have to always perform, perform, perform. Assets under management, low turnover and tax applications are also as with the value investors going to be a, uh, detrimental to their success. Their edge is the time horizon, which is the long-term horizon, long-term trends, and deep knowledge. They are visible on the charts through the absolute and relative trends, through long-term volume signature, momentum buying, and selling. Then we go to uh, much smaller market participants in terms of their participation and uh, you know size of their positions. Professional traders, uh, usually momentum and mean reversion traders, uh, medium to small size. Uh, they mostly operate on the daily, but could be on the intraday time frame as well. They're looking for the short-term overbought and oversold conditions and short-term momentum. Their limitations is that they have too many trades, high commission, which is not relevant anymore, or maybe less relevant short-term taxation, which is still relevant, uh, and uh, smaller size. Um, but the edge is quickness, as it is for retail traders as well. Uh, they also could have multiple of rules, multiple of models, uh, which is, again, al allows them to participate in different market environments, whereas bigger a larger market participants like you know value investors might not be able to do so. They are visible on the chart through the short-term momentum buying and selling, short-term volume, short-term liquidity, short-term swings, and retail traders are usually not that visible. Um, sometimes people would say, well, how do you see the retail traders? I see it here, here, and there. And I say that it, it's a very rare event uh, an occurrence uh, for me to see on the chart that the retail traders are seeing uh, are having some kind of impact um, uh, on the price. Uh, so obviously retail traders are us, uh, professional traders, proprietary traders, retail traders or registered institutional um, uh, investors, registered um, uh, advisors, institutional advisors. They could be of different size. I mean, like I'm looking here from anything from let's say 1 million uh, to let's say 50 million. Uh, they still would be in that range. Okay. Um, retail traders, one more thing here. They're looking for mostly breakouts and points of excitement. Lower knowledge, lower skill for sure, sentiment driven. Uh, and again, we want to transition from this bracket to let's say this bracket, professional traders, where our size is growing from small to about medium, and where maybe we are developing some kind of edge uh, just based on the momentum and mean reversion. And we understand how these guys, big guys are trading, and we are uh, following them in their trades and trading alongside. Okay. Um, how would we see weekends value buying trend institutional followers? Um, in the downtrend into the climactic run, we see that weekends are going to be capitulating. They're going to be emotionally exhausted. Get me out. Value buyers, the CEO, will be buying at that point of time. There is a value there and there is a substantial liquidity event where they could buy a lot and create a meaningful position. 
trend followers are inactive why well because there is no trend to the upside that they are seen at that point it's only in the emergence of the uptrend uh, uh, area where we can completely will become inactive they will capitulate throughout the trading range they will be exhausted and value still buy as a buyer trend followers are starting to buy because they are starting to see uh, the change of behavior in the price action or um, by some other uh, analysis they're defining that this is the time to come in. And then throughout the reaccumulations, you're going to see some kind of maybe uh, trimming profit taken by the value investors and maybe some buying by the trend followers investors just because the profit taken by the value investors so is creating a liquidity event for the trend followers. They use this opportunity and usually in phase A or early phase B of the reaccumulation, they they might be biased as well. And then the volume signature just diminishes into phase C before the price starts to go up. Um, and this is going to be happening over and over in the areas of the reaccumulation. Into the distributional formation, we see how weak hands are excited because they've been making profits on the way bar, uh, on the way up, and they're still buyers. Whereas the value uh, investors are already selling into the excitement of weak hands, where trend followers are still buyers, but they're gonna switch to selling in this area right here, and uh, by that time value investors are going to be already inactive and out of the position uh trend fall institutional trend followers will be sellers and sellers on the way down and that's what produces those big breaks to the downside with a lot of volume signature whereas the weak hands will be buyers in the trading range and will be hoping that the price will recover and recover fast enough you know after the initial breakdown and again, this is going to be repeating over and over and over again. Okay, here's an example of this Apple. This is the daily time frame, and we're seeing that in 2011 uh, into 2000 before 2012, we have two trading ranges. And even though the market was relatively weaker, Apple was stronger than the market. We're seeing that every time the price tries to go down, the volume spikes. Why? Why would the volume have those spikes? Opposing force. Demand is coming in, absorbing the supply, and that's what does not allow the price to be in the downtrend. Then on the sign of strength rally, we're seeing demand coming in again. And then the same uh, repeats in the next trading range where the market is already in the accumulation trading range and Apple is in reaccumulation trading range at the higher level, at the level of the resistance that is acting now as the support. So therefore, this whole area right here, an area of absorption, and I would say very aggressive absorption during the period of time when the market was weaker. So therefore, after that, once they bought, there is a period of inactivity and then there is a period where momentum traders are coming in. And as they come in and the price goes up quite significantly, uh, travels pretty fast, um, almost like what? Yeah, we're doubling here times two. The value investors are starting to sell. Look at those spikes. They, uh, the, that initial selling where supply comes in, what does it produce? Does it produce the stop in action of sorts, right? Just because this was so strong, the momentum carries us up, but it definitely carries us with a lot of uh, grinding of the price up. There is no ease of movement to the uh, way to the upside. And then when uh, supply comes in again, now we're going down easily. And this constitutes a change of behavior for us, suggesting we are, that we are in some kind of trading range. We'll cover this a little bit more and we'll talk about how we would label, you know, all of those trading ranges. Apple is going to be a really great case study for us uh, in many of our classes. Uh, but specifically right here, what do we see? We're seeing again, volume increases. 
And behind that, there is an increase in the supply. And finally, we're seeing how the reaction is increasing relative to the previous reactions in the same trading range. Bullish or bearish, a effort to push the price down increases and the downward result is increasing as well, bearish. And then we go into the downtrend. Okay, all right. I think that's it on the behavioral market analysis. Couple of last announcements. Uh, we also do have the Wyckoff Tape Reading Lab. So when I say tape reading, I should probably say Wyckoff Chart Reading Lab, uh, which I conduct together with uh, William uh, Readon. And uh, William, just an amazing chart reader, um, always uh, enjoy our sessions together. Uh, this is for more advanced traders. If you are uh, if you're familiar with the Wyckoff methodology and you've been trading Wyckoff method for multiple years, only then I would suggest uh, for you to go and check it out. Um, uh, but if you're a beginner intermediate trader, obviously start with the WTC1 course. And then again, you know, for those of you who are students in this class and or the, or for somebody who is going to sign up, for this class uh, today or uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, your home assignment is gonna be uh, to read James Forte Anatomy of a Trading Range. Uh, it's 12 pages, uh, so please take some time. I would take uh, a pen or pencil and as I read, uh, would print it out as I read, would just highlight certain things, make some notes. If you have any questions, uh, email me. Uh, and just ask those questions and um, you know if we have time we will discuss that. Also make sure that you go through the uh, exam and that uh, you also uh, fill out the questionnaire uh, for the course. And with that this is all I have for today. Uh, I'm grateful for those of you who are our guests joining us for today and uh, learning about uh, our course and Wycombe Analytics in general. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us at wycombeassociates at gmail.com. If you want to register for the course, go to our website, wycombeanalytics.com. Uh, find uh, the WTC uh, under the Life Education, register, either you registering uh, right away for the whole 15 uh, uh, webinars or you're registering it uh, as a uh, payment plan, doesn't really matter. Uh, you will get the access to your student profile page uh, with the exam, with the questionnaire, uh, with the first session, all of the videos, uh, are being uploaded usually within two and a half, three hours after the uh, after the session is done. So you will see that uh, in your student profile. If you are planning uh, to sign up, but you just want to maybe like rewatch parts of this session again, uh, this video will be uploaded to the Wyckoff Trading Method uh, on YouTube tonight. You could do that. And also, I would really appreciate if you. Uh, would suggest the course to your uh, peers, to your friend traders. Uh, we definitely are very proud of the curriculum and the foundational knowledge that WTC1 course has. But, you know, with that, um, I wouldn't say that this is just from the beginners. This is most definitely for both intermediate and advanced traders as well. As I explain, a lot of the intermediate and advanced uh, concepts, and more importantly, if you want to go uh, the route uh, of uh, Wyckoff education with Wyckoff analytics, you have to take WTC1 as the prerequisite. Uh, there were quite a few people that came to me and asked uh, if they could take WTC2 course right away, the practicum, and initially, you know. A long time ago, I would say yes, and then I would always regret. Why? Because people think that they know, but they don't. And uh, they also need to study our semantics. And there are a lot of blind spots that people have. So uh, people who didn't take WTC1 
would come to WTC2 and would distract the class, which I said that no longer I'm going to do this. Uh, so everybody has to go through WTC1. All right, let's see what kind of questions you guys have. Um, how can you use Wyckoff method with Elliott Waves? Can you recommend a book to learn Elliott Waves for beginners uh, from Sorry Bell? Um, yes, so Wy Elliott Waves and um, method is all about price structural analysis as well. Uh, you could definitely uh, have both methodologies combined together. In fact, uh, Jeffrey Kennedy, uh, who I consider one of the leading elocutions uh, right now, uh, and he is uh, a part of the Elliott Wave International company uh, with Robert Proctor. Uh, routinely teaches uh, with me, uh, I would say like every second year, we have some kind of special on the Elliott and Wyckoff combined together. Uh, so check that out on our website. Uh, you could find it in the on-demand session. And I would say uh, I studied Elliott Waves and I'd say it's just a preference of mine to actually you know, be more Wyckoff oriented. Uh, I see uh, the structure easier, um, understanding the Wyckoff methodology. But at the same time, I also could see like impulse waves uh, and some other wave structures where you have a clear five-way structure going into some kind of retracement. Uh, obviously, Fibonacci numbers are extremely important, whether it's a half. Uh, one third, you know, and Wyckoff talked about that. So, um, is there a book? Well, find the book uh, by uh, Jeffrey Kennedy on Elliott waves. I would most definitely recommend that as the practical guide to Elliott uh, wave uh, analysis. And obviously, Robert Proctor is like the ultimate authority on the subject. Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, Alex is just saying uh, Wyckoff method is quite useful and this introduction was excellent. Um, Jerry is asking, do you need to do anything to see the recording of this session? Jerry, if uh, you could uh, access this recording in multiple ways, as I mentioned, uh, you could find it in maybe around three hours or so on the Wyckoff trading method uh, uh, YouTube channel. That's uh, if you're uh, attending this uh, session as a guest. If you are a student, then go to your student profile on our website and we will have this session uploaded for you again within, you know, after three hours or so. All right, anything else? Any other questions, comments? If not, thank you so much, guys. Uh, for being here with me for this first uh, class of the Wyckoff Trading Course Part 1. Um, yeah, Stanislav <laughs> is saying I highly recommend WTC1. Well, Stanislav, you recommend it because you already took it, right? So um, I hope to see you in WTC2. I think I saw you in WTC2 uh, roster, so we're going to continue. Um, educating uh, ourselves together. Um, I am definitely, uh, you know, let me talk a little bit about myself because sometimes that comes uh, as a question. Uh, so I've been studying Wyckoff method for 25 years uh, plus. I've been trading for 25 years plus. I've been trading as a uh, individual trader uh, and as a hedge fund manager. Um, I've been trading different assets from stocks to futures to cryptos to options. I've been trading different time frames uh, from uh, intraday to swing trading to long term campaigns. Um, I have my personal preferences, but lately, and because of all of this experience, I would say that I'm not limited to any asset or any time frame. I am mostly um, trading opportunities, whether they are in a specific asset or on a specific time frame. Uh, you know, the opportunities where the price uh, produces expansion of revenue of PNL, 
those are opportunities that I uh, mostly look at. Tony is asking, if I sign up for WTC1, when can I take WTC2? Tony, you could take WTC2 uh, live uh, during the summer semester, which is the next semester for us, and that is going to start in April. Uh, if you, uh, let's say, I usually don't prefer people uh, to buy on-demand WTC1 and WTC2 together. Sometimes we'll make an exception, uh, but um, I am just into the proper studying and education, uh, and my preference would be for you to take WTC1, go through this very deliberately uh, uh, each day studying or each week, however much time you have, assimilating all of the concepts, asking me questions, going through the homeworks, that's the biggest value and then transitioning into WTC2. Believe me, I've had so many conversations with so many students about this. And you might say like, well, why don't you take the money right away? You know, like uh, times two. Yes, okay, yes, I can. But at the same time, I am, uh, it's just the, you know, the teacher's value that I have. I want to teach you correctly. Uh, and because I've been teaching for a while, as you might see, as you might sense, you know, like, please take my advice uh, to heart, and I would definitely, you know, do it in the correct way. Double GC1, double GC2, and then I will outline specific, even more sometimes individualized plan as to what you need to do next. Do you want to go to PNF? Do you want to go to tape reading? What is it that you're trading? What kind of time frame you have? What kind of uh, trading uh, analytical issues you have and so on and so forth. We have quite a lot of products that I'm not advertising deliberately, just not to distract people uh, to something else, which is going to be, again, you know, knowledge hoarding rather than skill building. Uh, so hopefully that addresses this. And obviously, Tony, I'm looking forward to working with you. All right, guys, with this, I think that's it for today. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, I will see you next Monday in the class. Uh, if you have any questions, if you're a student, uh, before that, most definitely reach out. If uh, you have any questions as a guest, reach out as well, uh, and we will be more than happy to answer any questions. With that, thank you so much. Happy trading, and I'll see you next Monday.